I'm going to speak about probiotic. When we consider probiotic and everything that is known in the, in the literature about probiotic, I have to admit that it scared me a little bit to do a review on that. Uh, there is so much data that we don't know where to start with. And uh, with Pierre-André, we decided that I could do something on the effect on gut barrier and inflammation. But again, the data in the literature is huge. So uh, be uh, kind with me. It's really a general presentation. And I won't go into the detail of everything. Uh, OK, go this way. Pierre-André this morning showed you uh, something that I really like about uh, the story of the beat, okay? Uh, getting into down a hill and up a hill, and you can get into a, a certain state where you get up to the hill and you get into a very, very deep uh, valley, and it's very difficult to come back to this mountain. So the concept is very nice, and it's coming, in fact, from this publication, from French uh, research team, uh, the people uh, in uh, Joel Story lab, where they are revisiting a little bit the concept of digestive health. And this is a very simple representation, but I think it's quite uh, a very good one. Um, it is, of course, for, for human, but again, uh, it can be uh, easily used for animal. It is based on four main components. There are the microbiota, the mucosal barrier, the immune tolerance, and the redox balance. And these four elements or four components are obviously very, very strongly interconnected. And when everything is all right, I would say, they live in a, or they function in a, in a perfect symbiosis. However, when the animal or the host is um, meeting some challenging or stresses that can come from the environmental uh, changes or nutritional uh, challenge and other kind of stress, this symbiosis can be disrupted and you get to this critical transition stage where the uh, microbiota diversity starts to be uh, reduced, you increase the permeability of the mucosal barrier, you increase inflammation, you increase the oxidative stress. But luckily, and this is the same for humans, we are uh, this, you can go from this stage back to the symbiosis. This is true only to a certain point where there is no uh, possible return, and in this case, you get to the stage of uh, altered symbiosis, where this time you get a very low diversity in the microbiota, a high uh, increase in the me perme intestinal permeability, sorry, and uh, a disturbed inflammatory response. This is a very similar uh, way of representing it, huh, with the, again the four pillars that you recognize here, but what I want to tell you about in my presentation is that probiotics can act at the four level of this uh, uh, digestive health com uh, concept. So, very um, simply, I will go through all the four of these pillars, giving you some examples of what probiotics can do, and if the mechanisms are known, obviously I will try to give you some, some idea of how it works. Let's start by the mucosal barrier. So we have spoken about that this morning, at least. And uh, I will take some examples from uh, Raquel's presentation, especially looking at the models she spoke about. The one based on Kakutu cells, where we measure transepithelial resistance of the cells. And we use this model, in fact, to uh, study what can be uh, the effect of probiotics. When you look at this system, it's very easy to understand that you're looking at the direct effect of the probiotic on uh, the barrier, because there is no microbiota in the, in the system. So we carried out a, a, a simple study where we stimulate the cells with uh, inflammatory, inflammatory sorry, cytokine, which is IL-1, and uh, we tested different products. We had a positive control, that is a plant extract, and we had also three testing materials that are probiotic, all bacilli-based. Uh, so this is the basal level of what you obtain in uh, the TER, well, 
sorry, this is the TR level that you obtain with the control cells. When you apply the anti-inflammatory compound as a positive control, you see that you increase this response. But I think the part of the graph that is here is the most interesting. And what you see here is that for the four, uh, three bacilli that we studied, we, um, we got complete, complete uh, different uh, story. Some bacilli are able to increase TR, and this is the case of the strain uh, Bacillus subtilis 29.784 that is in fact comprised in our product Alterium. And the two other uh, bacilli that were uh, tested here decrease the TER. So the message here is really to say that, first of all, probiotic can act directly without affecting the microbiota. They can act directly on the host. And also, this is a, a, a specific uh, or the st a strain specificity. Not all the probiotic can do the same. Uh, when we look at the mechanism of how probiotic can increase uh, or improve intestinal barrier, of course, I come back to uh, what uh, Raquel and others have described this morning. Uh, the people start to look at uh, what can be the effect of probiotics on, on uh, tight junction protein expression, uh, gene expression, sorry. So here an example of, uh, of a paper from the people uh, in USDA where uh, they have challenged animals with LPS, so they are broiler chicken, they challenged the animal with LPS, there were three groups of animals, animals that uh, did not receive, so that the clear bar, th that did not receive any supplementation, animals that uh, receive antibiotics, that is the second bar, and animals that receive probiotics. And what we see for all the measurements, uh, all uh, mRNA, um, um, or gene expression, sorry, measured here, is that probiotics are able to increase the, the expression of tight junction gene, uh, and as well as mucin uh, protein gene, to the same level of antibiotics, or even more than what we get with the antibiotics. Uh, some things that we also heard this morning is about antimicrobial peptide. I think it is very important part of the story when we think about the first line of defense of the animal. Indeed, the animal by himself is able to, to, uh, to uh, uh, inhibit the growth of uh, certain pathogens by using this uh, antimicrobial peptide strategy. Here, an, it's an example again, uh, um, on th this time on in vitro study. Uh, they are uh, chicken intestinal cells that are either incubated with live bacteria, so probiotic, which is lactobacilli, or it's actinate, it's actin inactivated, sorry, uh, bacterial culture, so looking more at soluble thermostable compounds. And the, the, the author look at the expression of defensin, which are antimicrobial peptides, in, uh, in the cell. And what you can see easily is that the probiotic can increase the expression of this defensin, and the uh, response is even higher when they look at the soluble fraction um, uh, produced by this uh, uh, probiotic, suggesting to me that indeed the mechanism is through the production of metabolite uh, by the probiotic. This illustration here is just to say that in addition to gene expression, they also showed that indeed the protein or the peptide are produced. That's all I want to say about the mucosal barrier and the, and the role of probiotic. I would like to move now to the, to the second pillar, which is uh, the tolerance and inflammation balance. So I don't think we, we, we can spend hours discussing that, but I think it's very clear for everybody. The animal has to tolerate what is beneficial for its growth, for its maintenance and everything, nutrient, its own microbiota. But of course, it has to be able to respond to aggression. So this is a, a, a very important balance. We heard this morning by uh, Burns that uh, IgA are extremely important when we, s we consider 
as a defense against aggression, but also uh, they are important when we consider vaccination. This is a study where um, <coughs> IgA concentration in, in a fecal sample were measured after vaccination li with live salmonella enterotitis or by following a treatment with probiotic or the combination of two. It's a very simple graph, but it's very clear to say that indeed the IgA production is much higher when the animals are receiving the probiotic. And again, it goes uh, very well with what Bernd explained this morning. The microbiota, probiotic, you will see this part finally at the end of microbiota at one point, is very important for the development of uh, IgA, production of IgA. When it comes to inflammation, I'm not an immunologist and uh, I won't go into the details. Some people do that very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's very important, uh, there is one pathway that is quite well known now by everybody as uh, a pathway that is important for inflammation. And uh, this is uh, the uh, NFKPAB pathway. We know that when this pathway is activated, there is a, um, a pro-inflammatory response. So in a recent review, I'm sorry it's so small, you cannot see anything, but I think it's a 2017 uh, review on probiotic and their effect on different uh, signals. There is a very nice uh, explanation on what probiotic can do, and they describe different strains of uh, lactobacilli here, or lactic acid bacteria, but also yeast, that can indeed um, limit the activation of uh, NF-kappa-B. And importantly, in this review, I'm, I'm doing some uh, uh, advert for this review because I really like it. They speak a lot about the metabolites that are uh, produced by the probiotic and that are responsible for this uh, decrease in uh, NF-kappa-B uh, pathway activation. And one, some examples are for lactobacillus rhamnosus uh, GR1 that produce uh, protein such as elongation factor TU. In our uh, own uh, lab, as I explained earlier, we use again similar uh, tools that what Raquel is, is using, but this time to look at inflammation. So in addition to look at TR, we also look at how the CACO2 cell can respond uh, to probiotics and the, the way we, we measure this response is by looking at ILH production. So the cells are stimulated with uh, an, an inflammatory compound, which is here uh, the, the mycotoxin. This is a level of the stress cells, so the production of ILH uh, by the stress cell. When we apply a known anti-inflammatory compound, the ILH, uh, decrease and when we apply the probiotic you see again that we don't have the same uh, response for the three of them. Uh, for Alterion, for instance, we, de we did uh, observe a decrease in this, uh, in this uh, inflammation. However, for the two other strain, there was more uh, ileate produce. What does it mean? Same thing than for the TR. It means that first, probiotic can act directly on the cell without going through the microbiota effect. And the second part also is that uh, there is a, a real strain specificity. On, on the right here, uh, this is a, <coughs> uh, a step further in the study. We have started to, to well, we try to elucidate how it works. And the first thing that we did is I would say my colleague, uh, Lamia Rayad, did. Uh, she separated, in fact, the cell-associated fraction uh, and the soluble fraction from the probiotic culture. And what she observed is, in fact, you get the effect on both sides. Today, we don't know exactly what's, what are the important compounds, but I th what I think is important is that to notice that at least part of the story is coming from the soluble fraction, meaning that part of the story is explained by metabolite production. And again, uh, 
Lamia did much more than that, and she's going to present that at the conference, so I invite you to go and, uh, and listen, to, to listen to her work. And uh, she has really investigated all the pathways, and especially uh, NFK PAVI. Okay, on the redox balance now. This is an interesting one, I would say, because that's the one that we don't really know when we, we consider probiotic. There is not much uh, in the literature that shows that indeed probiotic can enhance redox balance. The are data, but I would say it's a less documented one, have found some reviews. Uh, and the only thing I want to say here is that probiotic per se can carry antioxidant activity. Just for instance, they produce what I call antioxidases, uh, such as the, the superoxidismutase. Uh, but maybe the, the, the most uh, important effect might be by their effect on the microbiota or on the host, improving uh, the response to oxidative stress. But for this part, I think that Professor Surai would be much better than me to explain all of that, so I leave that to him for the talk just after. Finally, so sometimes we start with microbiota when we speak about digestive health, but I thought it, well, my feeling is that it's so important that I really wanted to finish with that. Um, when we consider microbiota, there is a lot to say about it, but I think the most important to understand is that it's a community. It's like us today, uh, all different people being uh, communicating all day, uh, sharing a lot, and uh, hopefully we are in a kind of symbi symbiosis as well. But uh, when we consider the gut and the microbiota, we cannot use another word than symbiosis. They cannot live without each other. Uh, a new, I don't know if it's a new concept, but it's new to me at least. Olabiont, what does it mean? It means that, in fact, the fitness of the host depends on and cannot be seen apart from its microbiota. You cannot be well as a uh, as human being without your microbiota. The second concept that is uh, very important to me is a microbial ecology. Again, microbiota, I like to compare to people because it's all about communication, it's all about relationship. Uh, how does it work with microbes? Sometimes it's very, how can I say, very basic, it's about food. They compete for, for feed, they, uh, they cross-feed each other, as Philippe explained earlier. Uh, they can have more sophisticated signaling um, uh, tools, such as ground sensing, which is in fact a signals from one population to another one, saying you can grow, you can become pathogen. It's quite elaborated. Uh, another way, they can compete, compete for adhesion, and Finally, we cannot forget about the antimicrobial activity, which is extremely important when we speak about the community. I'm sorry, but we are playing almost with uh, guns in this case, okay? And one thing I'd like you to remember is that uh, probiotics, in fact, even if they are not permanent uh, inhabitants of the gut, at one point, they will be part of this community, so they will influence the community. <coughs> Sorry, just an example of uh, antimicrobial compound, and obviously I took something about the bacilli species. Um, the, the bacilli species, in fact, is almost characterized, I would say, by um, the production of antimicrobials and anti-inflammatory metabolism. Uh, all bacilli produce antimicrobial compounds. The, the only thing that is important <coughs> to consider is what kind antimicro on, of antimicrobial they, they, they can produce. Is it very specific antimicrobial? Is it as specific as you know, surfactants or not very specific antimicrobials? Here is just to give you an example of what we have found with our strain. Why I just wanted to speak about antimicrobial compounds? Again, it's very simple. <coughs> In uh, in a community, when there are bacteria, when, yeah, when, uh, when a population has been killed or reduced, it's, uh, it creates what we call a uh, um, new ecological niche 
And as you know, nature doesn't like when it's empty. So obviously, there will be other communities that will come and uh, can fill these ecological niches. In one experiment with our uh, uh, probiotic, we looked at the effect of, uh, of the probiotic on the, on the microbiota community in, uh, in, the, in the second. What we found is that, uh, in fact, there were not so many changes, but there were two, or there were five, to be, to be clear, there were five significant changes at the genera level, and two of, uh, of them were very, um, very high uh, changes. And they concern two populations. The first one was Rhabinococcus, which is known to break down polysaccharide to oligosaccharides. And the second one was an increase in the lacno clostridium, which degrades uh, oligosaccharides and produces short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate. Why I wanted to show you this example? I don't know if it's true, but at least we can hypothesize that the probiotic will favor this kind of population. So if Rhabdococcus is producing more oligosaccharide, this oligosaccharide will be used anyway. So maybe they are going to be used by lactoclostridium. So it makes maybe a, a nice hypothesis that we have to check, but for sure it is a beginning of a cross-feeding story. And Cross-feeding is really something is very, very important uh, and basic uh, for microbial ecology. Philippe has, has shown many things for that, but I'd like to add two examples. And I will take our favorite uh, bacteria, the common, common so bacteria, at least for uh, human application, we know, and we know for poultry it's true also that fecalin bacterium Prosnitsai is very important in terms of butyrate production. So what, uh, what is this bacterium? So we, say we know it's produced butyrate. Uh, Philippe explains that it's uh, a tricky one. It does not grow if there is any kind of oxygen around. But it's not tricky only because it uh, does not tolerate oxygen. It's tricky because it needs a lot of things, not well, produced by others. One thing that is well known is that uh, Fecalibacterium prusnitsai uses acetates to produce um, butyrate. Acetate is, produ is uh, present in the lumen, obviously, because common soil bacteria produce acetate. But you could easily imagine, if I want to increase acetate in the lumen, maybe I can just bring a probiotics that produce a lot of uh, acetate. And this is not in poultry, that's not an example for poultry, but this is something that was so, uh, sought uh, years ago by the people working on human application. And what the probiotics they spoke about was uh, uh, bifidobacterium. So this is one case where probiotic can cross-feed beneficial bacteria in the gut. And the uh, more recent work, or at least for me it's more recent because I didn't know it, uh, is that uh, Fecalibacterium prusnitsai is very demanding in terms of vitamin. It needs all the vitamins, almost, whereas some other bacteria present in the gut, they can survive because they are producing themselves bacteria, uh, vitamins. Sorry. So uh, for uh, Fecalibacterium uh, prusnitsai that needs folate, I would propose why not using some bifidobacteria they produce uh, uh, folate. In terms of uh, riboflavin, we know that some bacilli produce uh, riboflavin. Again, we know that this vitamin has, uh, uh, are present in a, in a certain level in the gut, but if we want to enhance their growth, why not introducing some probiotics uh, providing the right uh, substrate for growth for uh, Fecalibacterium prusnitsai. So this is the end of my presentation, and, and I'd like to give you some key messages. They are very, I would say, very basic, but they are very important to me, at least. Uh, I think it is important that we all understand that digestive health is not only to speak about microbiota, mucosa, 
uh, inflammation or redox balance. If we do that, I think we are wrong. <coughs> uh, we were used to do that, but I think it's a time to change. We really have to consider that as a as a whole, okay, and try to work all together on that. Um, we know that probiotic, <coughs> sorry, we know that uh, probiotic can act at the four level of digestive health. Something that we found out, at least in our uh, in vitro studies, is that the the effect of probiotic is really strain specific. So, it, and probably behind it, for me, it's more about a function. The name of the probiotic does not matter much. What is important is what they can do in terms of production, metabolite, and a bioactive compound. So this is yeah, what I wanted to add to the last point. So with that, I thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I thank you for giving this interesting presentation. And um, we should have time for one question. So which one do you pick? I choose. Let me choose. <laughs> well, I, can t I can take one that is very quick to answer. I think the uh, direct effect of probiotic occur also in the host in presence of microbiota. Yes, uh, I, d I don't have example with exactly the work that we have done, but there is many publications in, uh, in, uh, in humans that show that indeed the host, the, sorry, the probiotic can act directly on the host without um, changing the microbiota, just because they produce specific metabolites. Uh, what is the optimum germination condition in guts for bacillus-based probiotics? That's a, that's a difficult one, because I would say I don't know. But uh, what, what we know is that obviously um, bacilli type uh, probiotics that germinate in the gut. There are also data showing, and again, it's more maybe on the human side with the other kind of probiotic, that even with uh, uh, inactivated probiotic, you can get uh, an activity. So that could be something that we can explore also for probi probiotics that uh, germinate or not in the gut. But what we have seen in our in vitro uh, work is that indeed you get more response when uh, the probiotic has germinated. Okay, thank you.